I'm here with Scott Stevenson. We're at uh, Learn to Train uh, number eight, final one of those, uh, and Scott was a speaker uh, mm -hmm. here. You've been uh, you've been a columnist with us for it's been six seven months something like that yeah yeah about a half a year I think okay and you and I knew each other from a little bit from before right. I was here right um, and you've been coming out to the compound every once in a while training with John and yeah, Dave we've got a couple good training sessions in um, so I don't butcher it okay and because you have such a, an extensive academic background. Mm -hmm. And because I'll let you prioritize which of your credentials you're going to list in what order, tell right. people a little bit about your background. Um, it's kind of a kind of a blend of things, I guess you could say. I'm uh, I'm an exercise physiologist, so I've got a PhD in exercise physiology, at University of Georgia. That was sort of a muscle biology resistance exercise focus. But I've been a competitive bodybuilder right now for I've been competing for 16 years, 17 years, lifting since I was a kid. So. Uh, I've got kind of unique, kind of old school, know some of the older bodybuilders, appreciation for that, grew up as a mu muscle head that ended up going to become a college professor, enjoyed doing that. And I'm also um, a licensed acupuncturist. So um, when I see clients in person or even when I help them online, I can address things from sort of the old school perspective, from a scientific perspective. And also because I'm an acupuncture physician now that I live in Florida, I'm a licensed medical practitioner. So. I've got some understanding of the Western side of things that they do interpretation, and then I can use uh, alternative medicine as well to blend those things together. But uh, my pure, my first love is probably always would be uh, just picking up heavy things and putting them down. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned having an appreciation for kind of some of the old school bodybuilding. Who who are some of the people you looked up to? Oh, I mean, I grew up reading the you know Flex magazine, um, Muscle and Fitness. Um, it's a kind of a generic answer, but the guys uh, like Gaspari and Yates, the guys who you knew went in the gym and earned every ounce of the muscle that they have, those are the guys that I think uh, they, I could relate to because mm -hmm. I was one of those guys who could just kind of walk by the gym and put on a half pound of muscle. Yeah. Um, I just loved going in there and training. Even when I was a kid, um, you know, playing football, we lifted weights for swimming, I wrestled for a little bit. I enjoy just the training itself more than the competition or the sport. I used to, uh, I mean, we had a, we had a one, one summer we had a, someone who kind of set up a program for us and it was four hours straight of weight training and conditioning five days a week. Mm -hmm. um, and I was eating nothing beforehand. And actually I think I, I was deep in ketosis. I did some blood work for a physical and my dad's like, he was concerned that I might even have diabetes. Uh -huh. um, but I was the only one who did that because I just, the more the better. I wanted to do mm -hmm. everything I possibly could. I just loved the the diving in and almost the altered state that you get mm -hmm. when you just go after it and push beyond previous limits. It's just something that's um, it's imprinted on my personality. So those kind of bodybuilders were the ones mm -hmm. that, you know, when I could kind of sense that they were there just to go in and grind and have fun, that always appealed to me. Well, one of the things that I've noticed from talking to numerous people over the years is that the people who, you know, don't genetically have things come easier for them, they tend to dig a little deeper and learn more. Yeah. Do you think that that kind of led you, or I, I'm guessing you're you're an intellectually curious guy. You would, anyways, anything you get into. Uh, yeah, I probably had a double whammy going because I didn't have great genetics. Um, you know, my 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 dad, my mom, neither one of them have you know big thick builds. We're not descended from Norsemen or anything of that no. nature <laughs> that I know of, at least. Um, and then the intellectual curiosity. So. Yeah, I was able to, to, to be one of those guys that, you know, there are many of them out there who, who they enjoy more of the digging in and learning about things, but they don't want to go and get in the gym because that's not their, 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 um, their proclivity. But I have a proclivity for both. Mm -hmm. So it makes for a nice combination, and I think there's an interaction there as well. So, yeah, a little bit of both. I was curious, but I also like the hard training so that it worked to my benefit. Yeah. We had uh, Bill Willis out here, I think a, a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, and, I, and Bill's one of my one of my favorite guys. Awesome. Uh, he he was a regular here, but his his studies have kind of made him you know a little less yeah. frequent. Yeah. And one of the things we were talking about, which which fits into this conversation, is um, in the the research world, especially the exercise phys. Mm -hmm. um, I know people that have done that that have been in the bodybuilding and they've kind of hidden that because <laughs> there's a bias against it. Right. Uh, they, they tend to be, I think a lot of that research is, is endurance sport based. Right. Um, for you did, you, did you experience any of that coming through the exercise phys program? I thought you were just reading my mind here because when you brought that up, I, I know, I mean the environment that Bill's in because he's not studying, he doesn't have that benefit because he's doing something exercise related. 
that was an exercise science. I was in, I was in a muscle biology lab, and while my, my advisor, God rest his soul, Gary Dudley, he's like, do whatever you want. If it's, if it's digging ditches, if it makes you happy, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But the general um, perspective, oftentimes in academia, is that at all times your studies must come first. You need to focus on this, and there's 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 validity to that mm -hmm. because to get all you possibly can and be really prepared to go into higher academia, you need to be sharp as a tack. Otherwise, you know you're gonna you're gonna fail. But um, yeah, I did start competing when I was doing my PhD, and it was an underground endeavor. No one knew about it, you know. Um, I remember even like trying to, uh, although it was warm at the time, trying to wear kind of long pants and baggy shirts so that some wouldn't see that I was starting to get leaner than I normally would have been. And all the training happened, you know, I was, I'd get up and train at 3 o'clock in the morning if I need to because mm -hmm. that was always my time. So, yeah, it was hush-hush. We told nobody about it. Uh, and it, it's interesting because now, and this was, you know, this was back in the, in the mid and late 90s. Now, I mean, they're, you're seeing publications where they've actually tracked bodybuilders mm -hmm. during their prep. There's, a, there's a, a few publications out there now, and there's a more of an interest. Um, had it been, for instance, a lab like um, I live in Tampa now, University of Tampa. Mm -hmm. um, Jake Wilson has a lab down there, and they're all they're all lifting. That's kind of part of the mm -hmm. gig. Um, had it been in a program like that, um, it would have been great. It would have yeah. been phenomenal. They probably would have done a case study out of it. They would have mm -hmm. gathered as much information as possible. But those weren't the direct research interests mm -hmm. where I was. So yeah, it was a it was a covert operation. Did you have to like I, I'm gonna have to take a, take a sick day because this dioderm's not scrubbing off? Oh, I'm trying to think. I don't remember. No, no, that wasn't that big of a deal. Um, you know, you just wear clothes to kind of cover yeah. it up. I think I was able to wash my face off. It, this was a long time ago. Um, I do remember. I mean, of course, I wasn't uh, I wasn't training. You know, I didn't have a, really a choice. I didn't train mm -hmm. for the regular days because it was you know it was a 15 hour day. So yeah. there were some periods where um, you know we'd have to be in the lab for to gather together things for research that day and it was at six so I got a 24-hour gym membership and I trained at three mm -hmm. um, which was kind of nice no one else was in there yeah. just had to get it done but yeah didn't didn't have to do that I think I might have had to uh, you know scramble right from a class so that I could get mm -hmm. to where I could put color on the night before yeah. and that kind of thing but um, you know there was no like n newsletter that said hey congratulations to Scott Stevenson etc yeah. well, another fellow student did the, the show uh -huh. with me as well so we were, you know, we were kind of our own support uh, system for that. Um, I, a lot of the the top researchers, they're they're not in shape. I mean, <laughs> they they know they know how they should eat and how to tell people to train, but they they're not able to do it themselves, or they did not make it possible for them to mm -hmm. do it themselves. Um, that obviously must give you an advantage now that you're through the program. You can speak with some experience and probably people are going to, there's some validity to what you say because they can see that you've done it. I think working with people, first impressions are very important. I, I will say that as a scientist, I haven't seen a study to show that most of the top researchers are not in shape. So I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> but I think there can be some truth that, as you kind of alluded to before, there's a, the focus in exercise physiology, especially decades ago, was so much on you know, cardiovascular mm -hmm. nature. There were very few people that were doing resistance exercise related things. Um, that a lot of those, then that doesn't necessarily jump out. You could have someone who's got a decent uh, cardiovascular power, decent VO2 max, and it wouldn't necessarily show up as if you know, that guy looks like he's ready to run a triathlon today. Yeah. Well, actually, a lot at the University of Georgia, for instance, a lot of the professors, there was a group of three or four of them, and they went out and ran midday. Mm -hmm. They jogged, they had like a three or four mile loop that they did throughout Athens, um, and they've stayed in pretty good shape. I mean, it was kind of cool to see that, to be mm -hmm. honest. But the resistance exercise and training for a bodybuilding show was kind of a different animal. Yeah. So, um, as far as uh, talking with people, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, so they see just any big guy in the gym they're going to walk up to, or any guy who looks like he's got something in his physique that they're looking for, they're going to talk to you. They m might not expect long words they don't understand to come out of the person's mm -hmm. mouth, but that can be, that's attractive to people as well. Yeah. So, for the average client, average person I'm working with online, you know, I haven't competed so long, that's why they would come to me. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people... Um, of course, they want the scientific background as well because there's a lot of there's a good deal of bro science floating around yeah. out there. Yeah, so it's a good combo. You're right. Yeah. Do, do you think that? Jeez, uh, I don't even know exactly what time it was that uh, that the supplement world kind of got a little bit more scientific. Probably around the time EAS and and Kreider's lab with the creatine yeah. studies. Yeah. Uh, before that. I, the, the first the first instance instance of that that I know of is uh, is Weider Nutrition. They were I don't know if you remember the anabolic mega packs that they uh, did. Yeah, yeah. There was a lawsuit because the the word anabolic. 
Uh, <laughs> and as part of that, as part of that, this is what Peter Lemon told me. They were right? vitamins, basically. So they yeah. didn't have any evidence against With some it. amino acids. Mm -hmm. um, part of the the settlement, the class action suit, was that they had to do a certain amount of research. So they went to uh, Kent State, got a hold of Peter Lemon, okay. and and that kind of brought the bodybuilding world into a little bit more research base uh -huh. and you know EAS and right. know, other companies. Um, do you, do you think that that do you see a little bit of that kind of making bodybuilding a little more acceptable in the research world? Um, yeah, I mean, it, there's, of course, there's going to be conflict of interest when you bring in an external company like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I'm not going to, you hear whispers, of course, about, um, you know, some research being somewhat slanted or biased and, and there really being a conflict of interest in terms of what comes out. Um, and that's always going to be a criticism. I, I mean, I could, I've got studies popping about mine now. I'm not going to mention one specifically for I want to be politically correct here, yeah. but there, that's always a criticism that you see when a company, even if they just gave you a, um, a supplement. Mm -hmm. I, for my thesis work, um, this was kind of ironic, uh, we, um, I was using creatine as one of the supplements, and for that reason, I wanted to make sure I had pure creatine. We went with Sigma, which is a research company, mm -hmm. and we were also using a drug that we had to apply for an investigation of a new drug application for. So we sent all that to the FDA, um, they didn't have a problem with that particular mm -hmm. drug, but they didn't like that I was using pure creatine from Sigma because it was something that was, that was okay. We analyzed it after the fact, and it was all right. But um, I think that what you're saying there is is something to that. It's it's nice to see that a lot of labs are popping up and they're doing bodybuilding science as well. Um, but at the same time, when that research starts coming into the industry, um, it also uh, kind of opens up the window for all of the the kind of fake science that you see bar plots and you know claims of a thousand percent increases in testosterone all these sorts of things and unfortunately and the average consumer really doesn't know how to interpret the science they don't, those graphs look great it's a selling point that now is a more important selling point and it's a, a way for for um, the manufacturer to sell things with just completely fabricated results performed at their testing facility someplace that may or may not even exist so, and even if you give the references, very few people will look those up. Those references, as you probably know many times, are completely unrelated. They were done in, in mice, you know, that are transgenic mutants, yeah. and they're trying to apply this to, you know, growing humans, probably not going to be too applicable. One of the one of the techniques I know supplement companies were doing in the past was they would they would fund a large study and be like, we're going to give you, you know, thirty thousand dollars. It'll be this. This particular person's doctoral dissertation, so he's counting on that. Uh -huh. They go, here's the 15 grand to get you started, and then six weeks in, they'll be like, can you give us an update on the results? If the results for their product do not look favorable, they say we're going to have to cancel the study. Sorry mm -hmm. about this, and then they don't have any negative results. Uh -huh. so, so they see what lab number two, what the results are there. Yeah. They continue stories. to fund that. Is that some that's something you hear? I, I've heard a, a couple stories like that. Um, that that's that's of course the reason you get someone stuck like that, and you have individuals that they're either gonna look at adding another two years of their life and what may even feel like a indentured servitude during their time to the doctor degrees, mm -hmm. or they find a way to figure something out. Um, there was some work that I did. Uh, it wasn't a supplement company, but they make um, health related products. And um, we did the work for them. They provided money for the lab, and that's phenomenal because it allows the lab to do more work. And this was, in this case, it was enough to let us do other, some other things that end up being published. But um, the the study itself was not of a quality that we felt was publishable. So we said, if you'd like to publish this and leave our names off of there, this was my advisor who's since passed on. Um, you know, it's it's your data. We we created the data for you. We tell you how you do it. We'll help you in all that regards. But um, you guys are you guys can try to publish that yourself, but we're, we, it's not our mm -hmm. not our gig. So we were able to do that, and the, and of course he was smart enough to know what you're talking about. You know we need to get we're going to get paid for our efforts, mm -hmm. um, and there's no pulling out and kind of leaving us in the lurch. Yeah. So that was a nice, and, and there's still there's still a good um, relationship with that company after the fact. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of um, there can be purposes served by the company. They can have that data, and that can be what supports their their application to the FDA. Mm -hmm. um, there is a study that an internal study that was done on uh, with the FDA. And you can find this this publication. I, I have it on my computer. 
published in 2011, 2012, and they, they randomly sampled like about 70 products. And those products are supposed to have some substantiation work, and there's a set of criteria the FDA has set up, set up that it would be a human study, because these are human supplements, um, and that you know obviously it would be a placebo-controlled study, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when they looked through each of these randomly selected products, none of them, none of them met the criteria. Some had gone through and been approved without any uh, research. Many of them had gone through and been approved with animal research that wasn't really directly applicable. None of those companies were actually doing what the FDA had set forth as their criteria for putting a claim um, on a, a label. Mm -hmm. And so it's really easy. I mean, it's, it's, some companies are going beyond the call of duty if they really want to get something through. They're just kind of covering their butt to have some data. Yeah. If the FDA comes back and says, well, look, we have these data, that's, that's going to be probably plenty for them. They don't even need a published research mm -hmm. study. But the published research study, of course, is a, is a penultimate selling point. They can say they can name the university where it was done. I think that ultimately lets people like, oh my gosh, that's a, I know that school. Yeah. That's that's got to be good. Must be. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily have to be. Where where do you see things going? Do you think things are going in a positive direction as far as uh, uh, f research for that applies to the meathead crowd? Oh yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, universities doing some real high quality stuff. I think. This is, I mean, I don't want to make it sound like I think I'm you know, something extraordinary and special, but one of the things that I, I, I'm trying to do, one of my kind of purposes, is to be the bridge between the research that just people can't understand um, and then the lay, lay folk who are the, the bodybuilders, the gym rats, the guys who are trying to figure mm -hmm. out what to take, when to take, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because I, I learned my craft, so to speak, as well as I could, and well enough to be able to look at studies in, you know, those in various areas and get a, a good enough grasp, at least I think, where I can understand that stuff and criticize it and then break that down for your average Joe so he can understand what's going on. So I think the, the main thing in terms of the research being um, something that's going to benefit the people, which is kind of the idea, it's not just to be supposed to be published and put in the shelves or you know, left on a computer database somewhere, it should be something that should be applicable. Mm -hmm. Medicine, of course, gets a, um, a first call above, you know, people trying to build big muscles in yeah. the gym who are, don't have, you know, they're not old or they don't have some sort of muscular dystrophy or what have you. But I think education of the people and, and just learning to become critical, um, critical evaluators of the research. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be as simple as simply um, learning how to use Medline or just Google Scholar is great. Mm -hmm. You can just type in the title of a, of a study that you see, or type in the authors, literally copy the information, even if it's an abbreviated, abstract, abbreviated reference, into Google Scholar, which is scholar.google.com, I believe, and it'll find the study. You can read the abstract, mm -hmm. make sense of it. At least you can get a first glance and see, okay, well, I'm going to think twice about this because this was done in mice, mm -hmm. and this was not done in men, and there's, could, there could be substantial differences. Now, if it's really impressive, it's like, okay, that's kind of cool. We've been talking about with the peri-workout recovery supplementation. Um, highly branched cyclic dextrins are um, a carbohydrate that a lot of people are finding really reduces gastric bloat. It's, it's easily digestible. Well, earlier on, some of the only research there was when they fed that to mice that were swimming, speaking of. Clicked mm -hmm. that in my head. Well, people are going to take that when they're weight training. They're not swimming and they're not mice. Yeah. So there's an ergogenic of that particular carbohydrate in swimming mice. And... I'm not sure about mice, but rats don't even really swim something. They just dive bomb, uh -huh. you know. And it's not like uh, they're swimming is you know at some pace and like that. It's just how long do they keep swimming before they, they stop swimming? Yeah. So the exercise test has issues. The species has issues. The type of exercise they're all different than what they might be applied for. Um, so that kind of thing you can get that from an abstract. Mm -hmm. You can figure that out. An average person with you know even below average intelligence can say, okay, I'm not a mouse. I'm not trying to swim. That's a first step in just taking the initiative to become an informed consumer and just being um, just relatively critical. Not, not that you want to be, uh, you know, tear people up and be overly critical, but just, hey, does it make any sense? So that's, that's I think, is most important. Pretty good.